grandchildren come over to our house, one of the first things they want to do is go out in the woods and hunt for wood to make a hiking stick or a staff. We gather together and get on those trails and we start looking around and we find strong, strong pieces of wood, ones that will last for a very, very long time. This past time, when these boys were over, they decided they wanted to make their staff even more fancy. So they sat in the floor and they took all of the bark off of their staffs. They love their staffs. Dr. Bill Allen also has a staff, and he walks to the church with it almost every time he comes here. He lives in downtown Houston, and he says his staff really helps him navigate the streets, and he feels safe. Not only that, people will look at Bill and say, why do you have that thing with you? And he said, I tell them the story about Moses. Isn't that a great way to create conversation and maybe even to give a testimony? Well, I have a staff too. This one maybe is a little fancier than most because it has a compass in the top so I won't get lost, which I do easily. And it's pretty fancy. I actually took it with me when I went to Spain with Hanania Pinto and Dr. Fleming, and I walked a short distance of the way of St. James. And almost every single person that walks that, which it's many, 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 many miles, almost everybody carries a staff. Well, in biblical times, Staffs were used by men to help navigate the rocky terrain. You can, you can imagine what that must be like to walk over there. You would need a staff. In addition, shepherds, of course, had staffs. That was a sign of their vocation. And they would often put a creosote-type resin on their staff to help make it very, very strong. I read that sometimes shepherds would make marks on their staff. Whenever a big life event happened, they would make a mark on the staff and it became like a personal diary. Legend has it that Moses' staff is the one he carried from Egypt and it had jewels all over it. That's a legend. He had been in Midian for like 40 years. So it's more than likely that he either made his staff or it was given to him because Moses had a brand new vocation. He went from a prince all the way to a shepherd. So Moses would have carried a staff too. He would have led his sheep with it. He maybe killed a snake or two with it. And he also, when he was looking over the valley, all across the desert, maybe he just leaned on it. All shepherds had a staff with them. In our scripture today, God tells Moses to go get the staff. It was housed in the tabernacle in the tent of the meeting. And we aren't sure whether it was Moses' staff or Aaron's staff. It's debatable. If you remember your biblical history, Aaron's staff was the one that budded and bloomed and provided ripe um, almonds whenever a group of people wanted to take over um, his job as a priest. So we're not sure which one it was, but Moses was very obedient. He went in and he got the staff, just like God told him to. And he went out to the assembly. The people were thirsty. Their livestock was thirsty. And they were crying out to Moses. So Moses was very obedient. 
Now, the staff actually appears for the very first time in the fourth chapter of Exodus, whenever Moses, the shepherd, went up on the mountain of God, and there he saw a burning bush. And he walked over to it, and it was not being consumed. And so Moses got closer, and God said, Stop, take off your sandals. This is holy ground. And then God said, What do you have in your hand? And Moses answered, A staff. And he said, God said, Throw it down. And Moses threw it down. And do you remember what it became? That's right, it became a snake. And then God told Moses to grab it by the tail and pick it up, and when he did, it turned right back into a staff again. You know, when Moses saw that snake, he was so afraid, he ran from it. But when he picked, up, picked it up by the tail, it just became a dead piece of wood again. So, you realize that Moses had to lay something down for a miracle to occur. God said, throw it down, and then the miracle occurred. And right then, that rod or staff became called the rod of God or the staff of God. And it was used, as you know, for the plagues to part the Red Sea, to strike a uh, rock to get water. That rod or staff performed many, many, many miracles. Not only that, when the Israelites were fighting their adversaries, as long as Moses held the staff up, they would win. When his arms got tired and he lowered it, the adversaries would win. So they had to hold up Moses' arms so that they could win the battle. This morning, I want to ask you all the same question. What do you have in your hand? What ordinary things have you had in your hands through the course of your life that God has used in an extraordinary way? Then I have another question. Do you think God is going to put anything in your hands in the future? And then just one more thing for you to think about. What does the condition of your heart need to be if you are going to let God take something simply ordinary out of your hands and use it in a powerful way? Those questions I just posed take a lot of thought. And I had to sit and think about things that God has used in my life thus far, ordinary things that he used in a powerful way. Last Sunday, I was jotting them down on my bulletin, trying to think, oh my gosh, what in the world has God used in my life thus far? I invite you to start thinking right now about things that God may have used thus far in your life in an extraordinary way. Now, none of my things could ever be as powerful as the staff of Moses was, how God worked with Moses. I have not parted any seas. I haven't parted any Texas rivers. Nothing that I have was in a tabernacle or even kept here in the sanctuary. But you know what? God has used every single tiny little thing for his glory. So I'm going to share my list with you. I hope that you will take out a pen and jot down some things that you may be thinking to. But I have to warn you, my list is strange, very, very strange. So here it goes. My list is, happens to be a rainbow, two inhalers, a yellow front-loading bulldozer, a double-sized mattress, a bottle of olive oil, a simple phone call, and a book. 
See, that's pretty strange, isn't it? Yours will probably be strange, too. My ordinary things don't seem to have the importance that the staff of Moses had, but listen to this. God uses things to reveal himself to us and also to reveal God to others. In other words, God will take anything to reveal himself to us and then we reveal God to other people. Keep that concept in your mind. So, let's start with the rainbow. The rainbow was how God revealed himself to me the day that I realized he was calling me into ministry. It was the day he took my vocation and turned it into an invocation. It was breakthrough day, the day I let go of absolutely everything in my hands. The simply ordinary place, we talked about places last week, was a jogging track in southwest Houston. And I went there, the rain clouds were thick, my heart and my mind were full of questions, and I just needed to be alone with God. I walked around that track three times, and I finally said, I don't have a clue what you want from me. God didn't answer. I walked a little more and said, I don't have a clue what you want with me, but I make a covenant with you this very moment to serve you all the days of my life. Done. And I kept right on walking. And there was a tap on my shoulder. And a voice said, look to your left. I did look to my left, and there was a church with a cross on the top of it. And from the top of the cross shot a rainbow all the way across the sky. I had never seen the beginning of a rainbow, but it shot across the sky. And, and my body just started sinking down to the pavement because I knew something had happened. A jogger ran by me and she said, awesome, isn't it? So I knew that she saw it too. Well, I realized right then that God had a new plan for my life. And I knew when I went home, my life would never be the same. And it wasn't. So whenever I see a rainbow, it is holy to me. It is simple. It's ordinary. We see them a lot. But for me, it's a holy thing because God revealed himself to me that day. Well, the inhalers, and I happen to have one somewhere here. An inhaler, like if you have asthma, the inhalers and the bulldozer go together. Can you imagine that? God revealed himself not only to a very, very sick woman, but also to a motley crew of missionaries that were high up in the hills of Haiti. We stumbled across a woman lying on a mat, and she was dying. We had nothing, only prayer and hymn singing. We took a leap of faith and told her we would be back tomorrow, and we would bring her medicine. I went to a doctor that night and said, here are her symptoms, and he gave me two inhalers. And he goes, she will die without them. Next morning, we headed up the mountain, and we got stopped by the Haitians protesting the work that had not been done on their roads. They shoved, they shoved boulders all the way across the road. I looked at my hands and realized I was holding life in my hands. And if this woman didn't get it, she was going to die. Our guy jumped out of the truck, went up the mountain. He talked to the mayor of the town. And one hour later, I heard somebody shout, holy cow, look up the road. And there came the yellow bulldozer. It swooped down. It moved the boulders out of the way. And the inhalers and a promise were kept 
for a wonderful, wonderful woman. We were able to tell her all about the love of Jesus. So, the mattress and the olive oil also go together. Mattress of all things and olive oil, those, oh, they don't sound like they go together at all. Little boy in the valley had never slept on a mattress. He slept on bed slats. And when we got there, we saw this, jumped in the van, bought a mattress, juvenile sheets, and brought it back we unloaded it and put it on the slats and said, here's your bed. The mother had been watching us the whole time, sobbing, sobbing, sobbing. She ran in her little house and got her cooking olive oil and came out and fell on her knees and anointed all of our feet. The woman was able to experience God's love through some people that bought an ordinary mattress on sale. But the woman was able to experience God's love. So this is my favorite one of all. And then I'm going to, I have one more and then I'm going to stop. But this one was a phone call, an ordinary phone call. I was out with my daughter-in-law, and the phone call came in. That morning, I had prayed to God, saying, God, if I had the money, I would build a business for my friend in Haiti. I prayed that. A phone call came in. I didn't even take it. On the way back to the church, I took the phone call, and a voice said, I wanted to tell you that so-and-so left you in her will. I went, what? She goes, would you like to know the amount? I said, yes. The amount was the exact amount that the young man needed in order to build his business. And there it is. There's his store. And then Sunday school classes went together and they built a patio and just in April, we were there in his store. God revealed himself to a young Haitian boy. God revealed himself to me, telling me about the power of prayer. The book, eh, that's simple. It was Facing Your Giants by Max Lucado. I handed it to one of my sons who was struggling with his faith. For whatever reasons, I don't know, God spoke to him, and he is now attending church with his family, and he is devout in learning about God. A book, a mattress, olive oil, a rainbow. God will absolutely use anything. If you remember in Jesus' ministry, he used a lot of ordinary things too. He used a donkey to ride on, mud to heal a blind man, bread and fish to feed the multitudes, water from a well to help a woman who did not know him, and he often talked about physical things to explain the gospel, like light and wind, flesh and blood, grapevine, cup. Jesus used ordinary things, too, in his ministry. There doesn't seem to be an end to what Jesus used. Have you thought of anything yet? Maybe something really, really different? Maybe you'll go home today and do your homework and jot some of this stuff down. You know, sometimes God will even put money in your hands. He put money in my hands for Roro in Haiti. But for um, Rick Warren, he didn't just put some money. He put tens of millions of dollars in Rick's hand. He wrote The Purpose Driven Life, and it was so successful that money poured in a book that he used his talents and his skills to write. He had no idea what was about to happen, but it did. 
And he said, when I wrote the book and the first sentence says, this is not about you, then I knew that that money could not stay with me. And so he gave it all away. He reversed ties. He gives 90% to the church and he lives off 10%. He set up foundations. The fame bothered him more than anything because everywhere he went, they, the people knew him. But he decided to use that fame for the voiceless, particularly children with AIDS. Here's what he said. What's in your hand? What is your identity? What is your income? What is your influence? If you will take it and give it to Jesus, he will make it come alive. He will do things in your life that you never, ever can imagine. So we've been talking in the past, what things do you think God may have used in the past with you? And what things do you think he might do in the future? And then what about the condition of our heart when we're using ordinary things and God turns them to extraordinary? Well, Rick Warren really answered that because he was humble. He didn't let pride or arrogance come in at all. He knew what he needed to do. He handed it over to God to use with a very humble heart. Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit gains honor. As you do your homework today, ask God to reveal any pride or arrogance that may be in your heart. And if it's there, repent and start all over and look at your hands and say, I have something in my hands that God can use in an extraordinary way. God's not finished with this church, and he's not finished with us. There's a future out there. He has given every one of us something, a thing called verbal language. When you have verbal language, you're able to tell other people about our church, our activities, and God can use that verbal language in a powerful, powerful way. But sadly, there are very few who take that seriously. And thus, we're not allowed to even begin to see what God can do. Our attendance, our attendance is so important. We can either go the way of the world or we can go with Jesus. That is a decision all of us have to make. And our money it is in the Bible, and it says you will never outgive God. Even 25 cents used in your hand to give to somebody, if God wants to make that an extraordinary thing, he will. He did it for Dr. Henson when he was here. A little boy sent egg money to Dr. Henson, 25 cents a week. And Dr. Henson talked about that 25 cents a week until the day he died. So, frustration, arrogance, pride. Well, the scripture that we read today, did you pick up on anything maybe that Moses had done? He did go back. He got the staff. But God told him to speak to the rock not take his staff and hit the rock. Do you remember what he said? You rebels, do we need to bring water out of the rock? We, meaning Aaron and Moses? That was disobedience to God. Not only that, he was frustrated, and I get frustrated sometimes, and I know you do too. But because of those things, not recognizing the holiness of God before the people, he was not allowed to enter the promised land. Merciful God, in his love and compassion, 
did let Moses look over from Mount Nebo and let him see that. God has worked with common, ordinary things, and he's going to work in the future with common, ordinary things, and he's going to make extraordinary things happen. He can use anything. The list is endless, whether it's a mattress or a phone call or a book. He'll even use your talents, your vocation. He'll use it to work miracles. Have you offered what you have in your hands today to the Lord? Are, will you offer it and let him take it and then watch and see what he will do? You have to lay it down. Once you lay it down, I promise you, your life will never, ever be the same. Let's pray.